Philip Buchanan's life was uprooted even before receiving a message from beyond the grave. Sometime during the year 2001, his mother passed away. However, Philip isn't given time to grieve, as the watershed moment is overshadowed by the sudden appearance of a letter. A letter from a supposedly dead father. Desperate to uncover the truth, Philip follows his breadcrumb trail to the frozen wastes of Greenland, where a bulkhead in the snow leads him to horrors long thought forgotten. It has been months since the footfalls of men fill the airs of the Northwestern mine. For the last year, the only sound to disturb the silence is the baying of the hounds, long mutated by that damned infection. But they are not alone. Two men, Tom Redwood and Dr. Roberts, have called these shafts home, have called these monsters neighbor. Let's discuss the mine before we get acquainted with these doomed souls. If the walls of the Northwestern facility could talk, they would tell a horror story. While its long, bloodstained history dates back to the early 20th century, the mine made headlines in 1930, when an abnormally high number of its workers committed suicide. Some of the locals blamed the Turngate, a pantheon of Inuit spirits they believed to live within the mountains. Other parties asserted more logical explanations. Researchers from the University of Copenhagen believed that a natural psychotropic was sewn into the rock. To make matters worse, Many of the miners had symptoms common with the early stages of paranoid schizophrenia. University researchers suggested that the delusions were fueled by this mind-altering chemical, ultimately leading the miners to kill themselves. Their hypothesis would end up neither confirmed nor disproved. The mine was repurposed into a British command bunker nine years later. Sometime after the Second World War, a strange cylindrical-shaped artifact was discovered. Though man made an appearance, its origin and function were a thing of mystery as was the source of its dim, undying glow. More on this later. The mine shut down in 1952, but reopened a scant two years later when iron deposits were unearthed. In 1969, things took a turn for the surreal when miners came afoul of malformed fauna. A Dr. J. Peters was brought in to study the creatures, the giant rockworms, and while these squamous beasts were the stuff of nightmares, their relatively small size didn't make them a danger to anything other than insects. However, the juveniles seemed to still be growing far beyond their natural limits. Where those limits ended, only time would tell. In December of 1970, a 14-year-old boy named Tom Redwood took a job in a Northwestern mine. Like many his age, he was forced to grow up fast for the sake of his family. Tom sent his earnings back home. Where home is, is a bit of mystery, being either the European mainland or possibly Denmark. But he was happy to provide. Sadly, the best laid plans of mice, men, and apparently redwoods often go awry. On December 15th, Tom became the victim of a practical joke perpetrated by fate. He became trapped in the mine after a cave-in. That he didn't perish might prove a Christmas miracle, except death would have been a mercy. After all, he was in the restricted part of the mine, so the likelihood of him getting rescued was beyond remote. The Northwestern facility had become his dungeon, promising a slow, agonizing death in the dark and dank. Oddly enough, Tom did not despair. He had companions in Shakespeare, Bronte, and Nietzsche to say nothing of the creepy crawlies which had called these tunnels home long before Tom was a twinkle in his father's eye. However, there was the issue of food. Tom supposed that he could sustain himself on the creatures, but for whatever reason thought that they would serve better as friends rather than lunch. Either way, Tom resigned himself to his fate, an inmate of the Northwestern mine, and he would not be heard from again for the next 31 years. In 1972, an accident took the lives of a number of miners, ultimately resulting with the entire operation being shut down. The mine was subsequently abandoned, but like most nightmares, it would not be easily forgotten. Whispers of its eldritch tenants found its way to the Archaic, a shadowy organization that has sought out proof of extraterrestrial life since the 16th century. The Archaic began construction on a research station in 1973. It was completed two years later. Situated atop the Northwestern mine, the research station, called the Shelter, provided a living space and workstation for all of the Archaic's personnel. One notable member was Howard Lafresque, the father of Philip Buchanan, who acted as the chief translator for the Archaic. Most of everything concerning the Shelter, its inhabitants, and the Archaic will be explored in the next episode, as I would like to focus on just the events of the mine for now. 
Over the course of the next 26 years, excavation workers from the shelter delved deeper and deeper into the mine. They uncovered artifacts of the same make as the one discovered by the British soldiers during the 40s, which they called Persona Tardis. On December 8, 1991, a water cave was excavated. Inside, they found a strange substance, which they dubbed Substance 63. Interestingly, Substance 63 appeared to be the primary material used in the construction of the Persona Tardis artifacts. The excavation team made another triumphant find on January 6, 1992, when they unearthed Artifact 66B. The artifacts are some of the more nebulous parts of Penumbra's lore. According to the Xeno report, Unlike the other findings, 66B appeared to be manufactured rather than being of natural origin. However, like the others, it emitted a low level of light from a seemingly inexhaustible energy supply. The artifacts, xenobiological in nature, also had the ability to absorb the memories of anyone who came into contact with them. But to what end? We'll expound further on them in the next episode. While all this was going on, the excavation team struggled to maintain morale. Their sleep was poisoned by the phantom cries of human voices coming from somewhere in the rocks. It affected their mental health, to say nothing of their physical health, which was under assault by more than just restlessness. The local fauna had grown incredibly hostile, attacking with ever-increasing frequency and in a seemingly coordinated fashion. Mounting casualties ended up forcing the team to abandon the excavation site entirely. On March 3rd of the year 2000, the Archaic discovered the holy grail of xenobiology, the Turngate Tomb. Because this will be the primary focus of the next episode, we won't spend any time on this. All that matters is that they opened the tomb, the proverbial Pandora's box, and with that, ushered sickness and madness into their ranks. An epidemic of some sort began to spread throughout the shelter, infecting man and animal alike. Many died. Many more fled, holding themselves up behind meager security measures. Only one man had the foresight to abandon the shelter entirely, Dr. Roberts. A mere six hours into the chaos, he was making his way back through the mines towards the very entrance Philip would climb down in one year's time. Roberts barricaded himself in a workshop. He had a limited supply of rations, but it would be enough to sustain him until the rescue team's arrival. Six days later, it was obvious that no one was coming. Out of food, Roberts was forced to abandon the relative safety of the workshop. He made his way to the old living quarters, but found no signs of life. After becoming lost in the labyrinth, he crossed paths with some species of feral creature. They gave chase, but Roberts escaped into a storeroom, spraining his ankle in the process. Safe from the salivating maws, he decided to wait out the catastrophe here, amongst the spiders and the cobwebs. Too bad for Roberts, rations were running low. 34 days later, he woke to find one of his eight-legged bunkmates nesting in his mouth. In his surprise, he swallowed it and was gripped by a new breed of fear, that the spider might be venomous. Fortunately, a day later, Roberts was still among the living, and that fear was replaced by the tiniest semblance of hope. He could eat the spiders, survive off them for as long as necessary, as there seemed to be an inexhaustible supply of them. Fifty days into his new life, Roberts struggled to hunt his crunchy little morsels. But after venturing into the basement of the storeroom, the apparent domain of the spiders, he learned that he need only turn off his flashlight to draw them to him, as they were averse to the light. By day 71, Roberts began to suspect that he made an error. An autopsy revealed that the psychotropic chemical found in the bedrock of the mine was also found in the spiders, and, if ingested regularly, could prove fatal leaving Roberts with only one chance for survival, to once again venture out and scavenge for supplies. However, there were three problems with this solution. One, he no longer had any light. Two, he swore to himself that he wouldn't leave until a rescue team arrived. And three, he found the spiders to be so delicious. By day 100, the spiders had become more aggressive, growing in size and number, possibly in response to Roberts' predation. Day 200 saw the good doctor barricading the entrance to the spider's lair and securing himself in the only room with an operational door lock. To make matters worse, a viscous substance had begun to form on his tongue, likely the result of excess toxin consumption. As a result, Roberts had to surgically remove it with a rusty penknife. 
He also used it to mark time, as well as carve depictions of spiders on the walls and desks like prehistoric cave paintings. Day 300 brought clarity. Though the bloodshed of the shelter was a fate far worse than the one he faced, Roberts decided to return nonetheless. He wouldn't get far though, another cave-in blocked the route back, and so Roberts was forced to return and accept whatever end life had in store for him. And that brings us back to Philip. Making his way through the mine, he comes across the storeroom Roberts is barricaded in. While Philip can make out his faint chattering, he never gets to see what's become of the good doctor. After exploring the basement, he overhears the pained moans of a man, a door crashing open, and the sound of something being dragged across the floor. The door is open, but the room is empty, save for the grotesque appendage that Roberts cut from his mouth a lifetime ago. A blood streak leads to a hole in the wall, which in turn leads to, well, God only knows where. The doctor's part in this chapter is done. We'll learn his fate in the next episode. While exploring the mine, Philip is harried by monstrous dogs. They appear diseased, zombified even, their bodies a patchwork of exposed muscle and decayed flesh. Not one for Hollywood heroics, Philip is forced to skulk his way from area to area. Interestingly, dogs possess up to 300 million olfactory receptors in their noses, making their sense of smell 40 times greater than our own. They can also hear sounds between negative 5 decibels and negative 15 decibels, meaning dogs can hear sounds that would otherwise be inaudible to humans. Yet, these hellhounds seem entirely unaware of Philip's presence unless they lock eyes on him. It would seem that whatever disease has gripped them has diminished their senses substantially. Lucky break for Philip, except what they've lost in perception they've gained in toughness. The dogs are notoriously difficult to kill, shrugging off blunt force strikes from a pickaxe like nothing. More on them and their affliction in the next episode. Pushing further into the mine, Philip finds a comms radio and receives a transmission from a man who identifies himself as Red. In an infinitely charming bit of characterization, he acknowledges that it is not his birth name, but a title that is rather similar to a cardigan, fetching when worn correctly. While genial, Red is an odd fellow. Like the mines, his mind is a labyrinth, one filled with obscure literary references, gaping holes, and dead-end thoughts that are rarely in agreement. Despite this, Philip is forced to accept his aid. Red instructs him on how to navigate the mine promising answers should they make contact. However, he is quick to accuse Philip of doubting him and his sanity. On one occasion, Red deceives him into going into a tunnel infested with spiders as a well-deserved punishment. Afterwards, he pardons Philip for the perceived slight. In spite of his erratic behavior, Philip begins to grow fond of Red. The mind craves companionship like the body craves water. In the Stygian depths of the mine, Red was like an oasis. In his explorations, Philip manages to see the evolutionary growth of the rockworms, which have bloomed to proportions large enough to swallow a man whole. Much like the hounds, they have been profaned by that mysterious disease and must be avoided. Luckily, Philip has a Sherpa in red. He learns more about his unhinged companion as he delves deeper into the mine. At one point, red prognosticates on what he calls the diseased ones. They sought to kill him, but Red buried them beneath a solid rock sky by collapsing a tunnel on top of them. Who or what the diseased ones are will be elaborated on in the next episode. Red also reveals that he is growing desperate for food, and that desperation led him to sup on the flesh of a man. To his credit, he did not die by his hands. Eventually, Philip finds Red, but alas, he has sealed himself inside an incinerator. He admits to not having the answers Philip seeks, claiming that if he knew what fate had in store for him, he would turn back. Red states that he has waited a long time for this moment, when the cord of his piteous life would at last be severed. Death has been an ever-present companion in the mine, but not for him. Not even by his own hands, for they won't let him die. Suicide is, quote, against the rules, unquote. Yet another cryptic puzzle to be explored in the next episode. As such, he asks Philip to activate the incinerator. Left with no other recourse, he grants Red's final wish and listens as his Virgil, his only friend in this underworld, is reduced to cinders.
When Philip explores Red's living quarters, he finds reams of books ranging from classic literature to survival manuals, as well as a soiled mattress and some posters of pinup models. In the bathroom are his rations, or what remains of them, a couple of squamous slugs pulsating in the squalor. Philip also finds a hangman's knot, a macabre reminder of Red's failed suicide attempts. Most importantly, he finds a solitary note which reveals the truth behind Red's identity. Red once went by the name Tom Redwood, but the delirium of loneliness and isolation caused his mind to deteriorate. Now, all that remains of him are the echoes of his screams resounding in Philip's head. It fills him with anguish, but he takes solace in the knowledge that the pain he caused him was, itself, all the help he could have offered. There's more to this story, but it'll have to wait. The shelter beckons. With the doors unsealed, Philip pushes headlong into the mouth of a subterranean facility. Red had urged against peering into the darkness, but closure can be seductive, especially where blood is involved. His father is still missing after all, and Philip is compelled to see how he fits into this profane puzzle. A real shame. Curiosity is like an abscess in the back of one's mouth. We prod at it with our tongues, reeling at an ache that would otherwise be tolerable until the ache sears and screams and we have no one to blame but ourselves. Perhaps Philip should take a page from Dr. Robert's playbook and just cut it off entirely. Metaphorically speaking, but he can't. At least Red has found his peace. For Philip, the nightmare has only just begun.